So welcome everyone to our first mental health forum of the spring semester. Um, just a reminder to people who haven't joined before, the presentation and discussion will be recorded. Um, we are gonna have a presentation and then we'll have a question and answer session with the attendee. Um, some reminders, um, you can post links in the chat and we'll post links in the chat, but the chat feature will not let people chat with each other. Um, and please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask questions. Um, and we will have all the resources posted on our website and we'll direct you where to go. Um, we'll also put the, those resources in the chat. Um, so I'm really delighted this spring to have Dr. Marilyn Cloitra and talk about um, STARE narrative therapy. Um, Mary Lynn is on the staff at the National Center for PTSD um, at the Dissemination and Training Division in Palo Alto, um, California, at the Palo Alto, California VA. And she's a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Um, she's worked for 30 years in terms of research and clinical work on the long-term effects of childhood trauma and socio-emotional functioning. She was founding director of the Institute for Trauma and Recovery at the NYU Child Study Center following the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York City and a member of the advisory board for the 9-11 Memorial Museum. She's a member, was a member of the World Health Organization, ICD-11, Working Group on Trauma Spectrum Disorders and was former president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. She also received the 2015 Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Practice of Trauma Psychology from Division 56 of the American Psychological Association. And then on a personal note, Marilyn's been one of my mentors for a long time now. Um, I had the luck, good luck to work with her at the end of my doctoral training while I was on my clinical internship and to collaborate with her on and off over the, la over the last decades. Um, and uh, I probably learned more from her about trauma, uh, both trauma treatment and how trauma affects um, women and men developmentally over the life course than from anywhere, uh, anyone else. So I really wanted to have her come to Harvard and I'm glad I finally have this opportunity. So thank you so much, Mary Lynn, for joining us today. Well, it is my pleasure um, to be here. I'm really thrilled at the invitation. And of course, like any good mentor, I've learned a lot, um, maybe more than you've learned from me, <laughs> um, from you as my mentee over the years. And congratulations to you and all the very important work that you've been doing over the last decade or so that's really pushing forward the agenda of understanding um, the impact of trauma in early life and its influence in later years. Really, really wonderful work, appreciate it. So I'm going to now um, share the screen. Let's see if I can do this appropriately. Um, and one last thing to do. Okay. Does can everybody see this? Okay, so yeah. good. So um, when I got this invitation, um, I wanted to take it as an opportunity to really thank Karsten for the invitation, but also for our long-term collaboration for many years. And this presentation is essentially a celebration of um, the, the newly released second edition of our collaboration with many other people as well, treating survivors of childhood abuse and interpersonal trauma, the STARE narrative therapy. Um, and I'll be talking about some of the um, interventions and rationale for interventions um, that are presented in the book. Um, I am hoping to speak for only 40 minutes so that we can have time um, for hopefully a substantial and satisfying discussion. Um, We'll see how it goes. It may mean that I'll speak a little bit faster towards the end, um, but I wanted to talk about the rationale for the treatment, some of the outcomes we've seen. And um, I thought, you know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the times in general, to focus specifically on the role of social support in our lives how this treatment can help support the development of social support and also the use of technology with this particular treatment as topics you know that are relevant to us um, this this year this past year 
So as many of you already know, um, we have a couple of different kinds of cognitive behavioral models of trauma treatment over the last maybe two decades. One is exposure therapy, which is, view, which is the understanding, which holds the understanding that PTSD is a conditioned fear response that's resolved via repeated imaginal or in vivo exposure to the feared stimulus in a safe environment, thus extinguishing the fear response. The alternative model is cognitive therapy, right? Where PTSD is viewed as resulting from trauma-generated cognitions, which are maladaptive, and recovery involves reappraisal and adjustment of these beliefs. And I think these two models, of course, have had um, done a lot of great work. Um, but I would like to propose, in addition to these, an alternative or additional model, which is a resource loss model of trauma that basically trauma is an experience of resource loss. There's lots of social resources that are lost, sense of connection to others is diminished, um, particularly through emotional reactions to events that one has that others might not have, sense that one will not be misunderstood. In addition, such as in the case of 9-11 or, or um, disaster types of traumas, people die, buildings collapse, people move away. And so there's actually a, a real loss of the presence of others in our lives. There's a loss of emotional resources. And there's even, I think, importantly, a loss of a sense of identity. Who am I that I, quote, allowed this thing to happen to me, that I reacted the way that I did, or that I was unable to perform as I should have under these circumstances? And indeed, some of you may know the work of Stephen Hopfel, who's empirically demonstrated the impact of resource loss following trauma. And indeed, he's found that with repeated exposures to traumatic events, there is increasing resource loss over time. And that resource loss contributes to increased risk for exacerbation of symptoms that already existed or increased risk of developing new symptoms or getting the diagnosis of PTSD. So it's important to pay attention to. And I wanted to break down this idea of resource loss a little bit more. And as I said before, I wanted to focus on the idea of social support, so important to us, I think, particularly now. We know from many, many studies that low social support is a risk factor for PTSD, depression, and other mental health disorders, as well as physical health disorders and early death. Very important. And also poor quality of life. So you'll see here in this spiral that half of the spiral is about the presence of low social support um, causing contributing to risk for PTSD, depression, and physical health. The other half of this spiral, though, is that these disorders or problems in and of themselves create erosion of social support. And for those of you who read this literature, it's sometimes presented as either or, but it's really clear when you study you know, longitudinal um, work that both of these things are in action. And one of the things I wanna point out very particularly what is that um, is the social erosion phenomenon. Um, when I was a graduate student, there was much more of a focus, which was many, which was a couple of decades ago. There was focus on depression in particular. And the view was that people's patients report of loss of social support was viewed as part of the illness. That is, you know, they had on their gray glasses instead of their rose colored glasses. Over time though, um, research showed that indeed individuals do lose objectively their social support um, network due to the symptoms of the disorder. And it's not hard for us to understand this with the, in the case of PTSD, which involves irritability, a sense of alienation, numbing, sometimes rejection of help from others. Okay. And lastly, I wanna point out where does low social support come from? 
many sources of low social support, but in particular, one of the strongest correlates or predictors of low social support in adulthood is a history of childhood adversity. That is people who have experienced um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, um, problematic home environments are less likely to expect positive social support in their adolescence and in their adulthood. And this is one way in which um, what they bring to a situation leads to greater vulnerability to the development of PTSD and other problems um, following a traumatic stressor. So one might think, well, if social support is so important and social adjustment is something that we know our patients wish for, what are the benefits of our current you know, exposure and cognitive therapies in regards to improving social support and social adjustment? And interestingly, I think there is now a sea change, but you will notice there are absolutely no meta-analyses um, that include social adjustment or social support as an outcome. And I think that reflects the state of the science that up until now, very few studies have actually included um, social support and social adjustment as an outcome. And then to the extent that this outcome has been measured in various evidence-based treatments for PTSD, um, if you look carefully, with very, very few exceptions, the pre to post effect sizes for either social support, increases in social support or social adjustment are around 1.8 to 1 point, sorry, 0.18 and 0.24. So I think it is probable that we can um, enhance our treatments in regards to these outcomes. And so I think the implications for treatment are well, first of all, that a key principle of trauma recovery is that fear must be resolved and meaning must be made of the past, right? The exposure work and the meaning making cognitive therapy are very important components to a complete treatment. But treatment benefits by including attention to resource losses that face the patient that is dealing with their current life, quality of life, current relationships, and preparing them effectively for a future, not only in terms of quality of life, but protecting them against um, negative impacts of future stressors. Clients who might benefit from this approach and stare narrative therapy is one are people who have experienced repeated traumas because we know repeated traumas are associated with increasing resource losses. Um, it's not the case that everybody might need um, interventions which help them improve their relationships, but one might want to flag individuals who have repeated traumas for the reason of continuing reduction in resource losses. So this could be child abuse survivors, refugees, survivors of domestic violence, and interestingly, of course, adverse people with adverse childhood experiences or ACEs plus adulthood traumas. Um, I wanted to break down a little bit about why we have focused on social skills and emotion regulation capacities in the development of social support and general and good functioning in general. There was a huge literature, again, you can see the imprint of my graduate school years on, on um, my thinking and the work that I've done is that in the late 80s, early 90s, social skills were the single, um, effective intervention for improving social support and um, the development and maintenance of good relationships. Now, what is an important part of social skills? Emotion regulation capacities that one must be able to regulate one's emotions and express, expression of emotions to be effective in developing good social skills and maintaining social support networks and the quality of relationships. Really great work done by George Bonanno and his colleagues at Teachers College in, in New York City. So this led to a, the very specific work that we do in STARE, uh, Skills Training and Affective and Interpersonal Regulation. The protocol that we've used in testing the treatment is 10 weekly sessions and it has been um, followed by narrative therapy, which is a modification of exposure therapy, which includes a large component of meaning making. 
assigning meaning to um, the stories of the traumas that are told um, and various stories or events are reviewed um, through the lifespan and put together in a meaningful way. Um, and that's about eight sessions for a total of 18 sessions. I wanted to give you a, a visual of what stair narrative therapy looks like in its 18 sessions. We do the five sessions of emotion regulation, five sessions working on enhancing relational and social capacities. And then when we move to the exposure and cognitive work, um, we also layer in continued attention to emotion regulation and, and social functioning. The STAIR interventions include tracking emotions daily, becoming more aware of what one feels, um, learning and practicing emotion regulation strategies. And these include things like soothing the senses, thought shifting, positive activities, and distress tolerance for valued goals, including very immediately engaging in the therapy and finishing the therapy. Um, I think STAIR is very, um, particular in the way it views improvement in beliefs about relationships. Um, there's a lot of work on um, role playing so people know how it feels behaviorally to engage effectively with others. There's a lot of practice of interpersonal skills, engaging with others, standing your ground, but with compassion for the other person that you're speaking to and oneself. And I think importantly, um, the cognitive reappraisal that we do, or what's called working models of attachment, um, are not confrontational. We do not say things like, why do you believe that you can't trust anyone? That's self-evident for people who have had repeated traumas, particularly in early life, that they've had a series of betrayals. And the idea that that isn't the case kind of mm, presents that you don't really understand you know, sustained trauma. So we begin with the idea of respect for the old beliefs, validation um, of their reality based in experience, and also even expression that these old beliefs had an adaptive function in a traumatizing environment, that the understanding that one could not trust, um, say, significant peoples in one life was protective over time. Um, so there's a lot of validation of that. However, uh, the partner to the validation of the old beliefs um, is an invitation to the person to open a door to a new life, right? And build a new roadmap. And this is a lot of work. And um, so it's not a deconstruction of the lack of accuracy of people's beliefs, but rather an aspiration to believe something different than what experience has taught one. So your goal as a therapist in this particular um, program is to facilitate people ex having experiential learning and attention to new and positive experiences. So there have been now three randomized controlled trials of STAIR narrative therapy. The first was simply against a waitlist control, showing that it was effective compared to waitlist. The second was stair narrative therapy versus its component parts, where we found that the two components, stair plus exposure, were better than one or the other alone. Um, and a third and recent trial has compared stair narrative therapy to a very extended prolonged exposure, um, as well as intensive exposure and showing that it provides equivalent results to one or the other of these treatments if you were to wish to do highly extended PE or intensive PE. All right, I also want to mention a, a highlight of the work. In addition to the science that we were doing, um, the Treating Survivors of Childhood Abuse book was um, a prop in uh, the Walking Dead television show. It was um, part as um, I think citizens of the world were running away from zombies. Uh, they found a, an empty domestic violence shelter uh, where this book was in the background. And the reason that I bring this up was that my son um, always thought that my work was only somewhat 
important relative to his other parents. He had four parents. Um, and I think this um, convinced him that what we do might be important. So I, I gathered some respect um, in his eyes after this um, television presentation. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the more recent work that we've been doing, which is focusing on stare alone. And there are a lot of reasons to focus on stare alone. There are clients who only want to work on improving functioning. They don't want to do the tra trauma-focused work. Um, there are clients who have already completed trauma-focused treatment, but still have social and functional impairment. And stare alone might be useful for clients with multiple comorbidities, that is people with low level PTSD and depression and some substance abuse, et cetera. That stare is trauma informed, but has a transdiagnostic quality in that we know now that emotion regulation and relationship problems persist across a variety of diagnoses, particularly among those who have a trauma history. So we began paying attention to this and very recently completed a randomized controlled trial of a five session STARE program in VA with both men and women. And we were um, expecting to see very good effect sizes for emotion regulation and social engagement, but we were pleasantly surprised to see the strength of the um, intervention for both PTSD and depression. And I think we can explore maybe the mechanisms of action for this change in, in our discussion section, because we don't know for sure. So that result has been uh, wonderful. Um, we've also recently completed STAIR de delivered via telemental health. And I'm bringing this up now because of COVID-19 and the question of whether interventions are effective um, in the context of um, video. And what you'll see here is, well, it was a very small trial, it was an N of 10 people. Um, and all of the veterans who participated in this were women veterans. We had a particular call for women veterans who had experienced military sexual assault, many of whom do not wanna to come to VA because they don't feel welcomed or comfortable there. So, we got a little bit of funding um, to do outreach to this population. And so of course, I think we found our effect sizes I think are very large because we, people self-selected into this program. Um, but again, what was interesting I think and fair to point out is that the effect sizes were strong not only for emotion regulation represented by the DERS but also um, social functioning as represented by the HUDAS. Um, as well as the PCL, PTSD and depression. So based on this, um, we started thinking more about using telemental health, but supported by a web-based um, web -based version of STAIR. And we wanted to do this um, primarily to increase access of STAIR to people who did not wanna come into VA. Um, but also to increase um, the kinds of providers um, that might want to use STAIR. The web-based version is very highly structured. Um, there's a lot of the interventions presented on video, um, audio versions of exercises in compassion and focused breathing, et cetera. So it would allow um, lay people, peers, um, and mental health technicians, as they're called in VA, to use the treatment, increasing resources, and possibly reach of the intervention. And the way that we did this, the first cycle was very similar to CALM, which is um, the CALM program. I don't know if you all know it. It's Coordinated Anxiety Learning Management Program that was developed by Michelle Krask and colleagues. Um, where say a, a nurse and a patient in primary care get together and reference the web-based program together and walk through the interventions. So basically we developed WebStare um, thinking that hmm, if Calm can work fairly well 
for individuals with PTSD, perhaps a program that's highly trauma saturated trauma informed might be able to do a little bit better. So it was like the calm program, but from a distance. What, what you see on the screen is a version of the web program where you know the exercise is emotion surfing and below is a picture of what could be a patient and a therapist. So what were, oh, we received substantial funding by the VA Office of Rural Health, thinking this might be a great combination for veterans who lived in rural areas who, who could not by dint of distance come into VA. So we developed a series of um, things we wanted to test. First of all, does WebStare in this combination with video work? Um, we later wanted to look at does WebStare work without the presence of the therapist in sync with the with the work work with the web, and um, reducing the amount of therapist involvement in the second phase, and then the third phase was looking at dosing whether dosing effects, say seeing the therapist five times over ten sessions. Um, was not inferior to seeing the therapist 10 times weekly over sessions. So those were the queries, um, questions that we asked. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, pretty good. So these were our results. Um, we had an initial series of 80 veterans mixed both men and women um, using what we're calling therapist guided Webster where the therapist guided the patient through the work. Um, the effect sizes were good uh, for PTSD and depression, as well as for emotion regulation and interpersonal functioning. And lastly, again, um, in social functioning. Um, the HUDAS is an interesting and useful measure for a lot of reasons. First of all, it was developed by the World Health Organization and is used internationally. Secondly, it has subscales that look at not only day-to-day -day functioning, um, are you doing your job? Are you taking care of household um, responsibilities, et cetera? But has two other subscales, which are very relevant, I think, um, to the idea of social support. One is how easily can you make friends and keep them? And um, thirdly, how well do you feel an integrated member of your community? And what you'll see here is very significant reductions in problems in these areas. So that was very nice. Um, this was a mixed method study. And I'll just share with you a little bit of what the veterans had to say. Sharing over video telehealth was uncomfortable at first, but then you get used to it. Being able to see her face was helpful and it made it easier to trust her. She could see the glitches in the program. It was comforting to see the person not just talking to her. My therapist was aware of my surroundings and could ask if I was feeling okay. There was a lot of trepidation amongst VA therapists regarding the use of telemental health. Um, so we wanted to be careful and do uh, qualitative assessments or interviews of both therapists and veterans. And overall, um, the response to this combined modality integrated technology was, was very positive. There was a glitch, however, let me see if I, oh, I, I didn't put up a slide, but the issue of doing dual technology of showing a web and showing faces together um, was problematic in terms of broadband. Um, there were 93% of the veterans who participated in the study uh, reported some kind of technology glitch like the screens freezing or pixelation of the screen. So we thought, well, why don't we try WebStare where the person is seeing the coach after they finished the session? And the other thing that we wanted to evaluate was could we reduce the amount of therapist time? Um, because of low resources, there is pressure for therapists to be seeing more patients. And we wondered whether we could reduce um, from weekly sessions to bi-weekly sessions. And we worked very hard in thinking about what the reductions should look like. Um, 
we had a lot of different stakeholders in this project. And one group, of course, were our clinicians who felt that they did not want to go down any lower than 50% of the total sessions. So that was how we began this pilot work. And you'll interestingly, you'll see that the effects were about the same. In fact, slightly better, um, including for the DERS and the interpersonal functioning. And we thought about why the effects were so strong. And um, our best guess right now is that there is this dynamic, reciprocal dynamic in um, having the patient work by themselves um, and develop mastery on the material, knowing full well that they're going to have a session later with their therapist who creates a, in them a sense of accountability and also allows the therapist to do higher level work in terms of tailoring the interventions and doing a deeper dive into the meaning of the work they're doing and the beliefs that they're holding. We also looked at the therapeutic alliance um, in the version where therapist and client were together working on the web and the asynchronous version. And you'll see in both cases, based on the WAI, which has a scoring range of one to seven, that at mid-treatment and post, the therapeutic alliance ratings by the patient were very high, 6.5, 6.39. And similarly, um, in the self-guided version, mid-treatment 6.46 and at post 6.36. The one thing that we saw that was different was the completion rates. When the, the veteran worked with their therapist simultaneously, um, the completion rates were about 65%, um, meaning that 65% of veterans completed seven, at least seven of the 10 modules. And this was a bit lower when it was self-guided. Uh, sorry, I was trying to look at my screen. Uh, uh, I think I can't see my screen, but I think it, it is lower, it's 59%. All right, so what are our conclusions here? Hybrid integrated telehealth plus the web approach is effective. The asynchronous approach may be superior and our qualitative data point to a process of a reciprocal dynamic of accountability, which is the result of the work um, with the therapist, but also mastery, which is the result of working alone on, on this material. We ultimately then went to ask our final question, um, which was bothering the clinicians. Well, are we cheating our clients by just giving them coaching which is every other week, which is coach five versus every week of the, of the 10 sessions, which we called coach 10. So we developed um, a study, our final study um, of 10 sites, 10 VA sites, five were enrolled in each condition and each condition enrolled 101 patients across the five sites. And we hypothesized that coach five would be not inferior to coach 10 on all five outcomes. Um, and that is basically what we found. Um, what you see here um, is the difference in amount of change between coach five and coach 10. That solid blue line would mean that there's a zero difference, meaning that coach five and coach 10 were equivalent um, to the extent that coach five produced less change you would see um, um, the number of points moving towards the left where that red broken line represents the amount of points that we would determine would be significantly and clinically inferior to coach 10. And what you'll see interestingly is that coach five actually did a little bit better than coach 10. So again, the result is pretty much the same. Um, and overall, our conclusions are that STAIR alone contributes substantially to social and interpersonal functioning, as well as reductions in PTSD and depression. The role of the therapist has been identified by clients through our qualitative work as critical. 
and future research might include exploring this dynamic relationship between the development of mastery and the therapeutic alliance across time. Um, Tech-supported interventions may be useful, particularly in low-resource areas. Our clinicians were a mix of psychologists and MSWs, some of whom had were very unfamiliar with PTSD. Um, none of them were particularly familiar with STARE, and we have looked at um, differences in outcome by discipline and level of experience in PTSD, and we did not see any differences, so, so that's a good sign. And the last thought is possibly incorporating social interventions like STAIR to trauma-focused interventions among those who have identified difficulties in these domains. Can we do better using um, standard treatments and incorporating uh, brief um, tech-based interventions that introduce a new component to the treatment and I think, as you can see, the dates of these studies in the, you know, from 2013 now to 2021, there's been a lot more work looking at the relationship between social support and PTSD over time in the context of trauma-focused um, treatments. And we're seeing a few things. I mean, I think basically there is, you know, uh, these things are correlated with each other at any point of time, and there's um, impact of one upon the other across time. But certain um, uh, consistent results are emerging. First of all, that at levels of um, severe PTSD, that PTSD interferes with improvements in social support. So perhaps, you know, a social intervention, social support intervention can be added to help. And um, Alternatively, or conversely, um, at least three studies now have found that strong social support, strong social support helps the reduction of PTSD and trauma-focused treatments. For example, veterans who engaged in prolonged exposure, who reported emotional support, experienced more rapid and greater overall reduction in PTSD symptoms um, than those reporting less support. I think what we need to figure out um, over time is the relationship between those two. How severe does the PTSD have to be so that it negatively impacts um, the improvement in social support in a trauma-focused treatment? And conversely, how strong does the social support need to be um, in a treatment to help reduce PTSD? Or how low does social support need to be to impair or negatively impact uh, reduction in treatments. Um, these are things we don't know, but I think what is beginning to be shown in these various studies is an interest in looking at the reciprocal relationship of these two things across time. So what might be our next steps? I do think over time that to become more patient tailored, that we can look at um, our interventions in series of modules select those that are a match to patients' problems and are clinically significant, that this will help patient engagement, reduce patient attrition, and ultimately be a more effective and efficient approach um, to treatment outcomes. This type of, quote, matching a patient to modules has already been demonstrated as a highly efficient and effective approach by Bruce Chorpita and various others in uh, child um, psychopathology studies. We have not yet applied it or very limited applications to PTSD in, a, in adulthood, but I think it could be something we could do where in stare narrative therapy, it already actually has at least three components, emotion reg, um, relational social capacities, and the trauma-focused work, that we can look at these three different modules and just select out the ones that engage the patient, seem to be relevant to the thing that's bothering the most, and decide together um, which of the three should be done first, second, and third. Um, I also want to mention that right now there is on your iPhones available a stair coach. Um, this can be, you know, a complement to work in individual or group modalities. Um, here's some um, screenshots of stair coach um, 
There are soothing the senses exercises, there's thought shifting, there's recommendations for pleasant activities. Um, and um, the book is also a useful resource. So I'm gonna stop there. Oh, perfect, 40 minutes um, for discussion. Thank you, Marilyn. That was um, that was that was wonderful. And as I we were talking before this started, I wasn't familiar with the app or the web-based stare. So I have a I have a ton of questions. But um, first, a question from the audience. Um, someone noted that stare was um, adapted in one of the studies you cited for a Latinx sample, and wanted to know um, what were the issues or challenges of cultural adaptation um, for this that study or others, and how you address them and um, what your experiences is with other cultures or um, immigrant or refugee communities? Because I actually know you were, I know you worked in a lot of different populations with STARE. So you can talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the person who did this, the study of STARE in the uh, Latinx community is Sarah Valentine. And I have to say, I've been so busy, I don't actually know what it is that they did to adapt um, STARE. Um, so, I don't really have um, good ideas. I think probably a translation of some terminology and some Spanish phrasing might've been helpful. Um, I think the relationship to the therapist is very important. And there's an emphasis on making sure that therapist and patient feel good connecting to each other. I mean, I think that's in regular stare, but I think um, that it was highlighted in particular that people, especially um, peer kinds of therapists maintain the importance of the therapeutic alliance before the interventions, right? That that's very healing. The other population that I've worked with very closely are the Yazidi women. Right. right. Um, and that, and we worked very hard together on a five day um, workshop adapting the pro stare. And to it. And actually the interventions themselves did not change so much. I was very interested to see that the idea of a cognitive reappraisal completely made sense. Self-soothing completely made sense. The importance of social support completely made sense, but it was in the particulars of the culture, right? By virtue of examples for how do you sen sen soothe your senses that information emerged. And I learned a lot about Yazidi culture as a result, um, you know, they shared with me their culture. So when we reviewed self-soothing through listening to music, they shared the kind of music um, that was enjoyable, um, kinds of foods that were viewed as soothing, kinds of visions, um, visual um, presentations, a lot of focus on the sun because it's a culture that focuses on the sun. And there was something else I wanted to to mention, which I am forgetting right now. But anyway, it was not so, I was surprised to see that the highest level concepts completely made sense, but it was their implementation that needed adaptation to the specifics of the culture. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question was, um, how might STARE accommodate someone who is an ongoing abusive relationship or has ongoing trauma? So uh, the person said, I know, and I know she's a clinical psychologist, I'm thinking it would be hard to create a new roadmap if this is the case. And how would you recommend handling this as a clinician? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's a question that comes up quite a lot. And I think um, that this treatment is not the place to start if a person's in a currently abusive relationship, that there are very specific, you know, um, uh, intimate violence perpetration protocols that should be used first, um, getting the person to a place of safety. I think probably a lot of co cognitive work around um, leaving and why it's okay to leave and why it's important to leave and why it's not good to go back. Um, and I think maybe around that place, um, the stair work around relational models can be introduced, but I think safety, you know, removal from the situation, safety first, material support, and then um, with it, cognitive reappraisal. Yeah, that makes, a, that, that makes a lot of sense. And as we know, 
um, having a history of childhood abuse is associated with having this kind of relationship problem. So I, I imagine it does come up a lot. Um, but else asks, how does the process of me making meaning of the past or the traumatic event, how does it, how does it work or mean in this context of stare narrative therapy? Yeah, that's a really great question. Yeah. I think um, there's an, you know, I, I think in maybe standard cognitive therapy, you could say something like, um, you believe that you can't trust anyone. Well, here are what might be exceptions to the rules or alternative ways of thinking about it or reduce your generalizability of it. What we do is create a narrative where a person goes back in time, reviews why they, what happened. And then after we listen to the narrative on a tape, we review why it makes sense to believe why the person did believe that way and ways in which it possibly made them safe. Um, and then we also um, never actually reject that belief. We say that was a belief you had at a time in your life and a chapter of your life. Mm -hmm but now you can write a new chapter of your life um, where the idea is that everyone takes their beliefs with them. And, you know, a client that I was working with at one time, as we were changing, as she was changing her beliefs about what was possible, she actually said, I don't want to leave behind the beliefs that I had as a child, because it would be a rejection of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't be a whole person anymore. And that taught me a lot, you know, that we do create this autobiography of experiences and beliefs that were associated. And there's an evolution to one's beliefs and sense of self, not a rejection, you know, of past beliefs. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's really interesting. I am. Um, um, okay, so more, <laughs> I feel like I just want to talk to you about that more. But um, um, something else I was curious about were um, you, what you noted about, you looked at the, uh, I think the treatment effects would given by, uh, I think, psychologists versus social workers. And I wondered if you thought at all or considered um, would STARE maybe, or even web-based STARE work with other sort of even non very mental health trained people. For example, in global settings, people often use non like paraprofessionals or non-professionals or nurse practitioner, someone who's in medicine, but not in mental health. And um, any thoughts about that? Um, yeah. That's too much I, of a stretch or? You know, I'm not an expert in this area, yeah. um, but my experience is that um, it's hard to know. Right. Um, some people just cotton on to um, the basic ideas and principles of trauma and trauma treatment um, have a very natural way with people and others don't. And I think we don't know, say in the use of, of peer counselors, who will be effective and who will not, like what are the characteristics needed? Um, I mean, I know there is work in this area um, to yes, yeah. select out people and to train people. And I think um, STARE and web STARE are two interventions that might be deliverable by peers um, and by non-mental health folks. Um, I'm not sure who they should be and, and how right. to train them. Right, there are people, yeah, there are, yeah, there are people who that's what they do. And I was just curious about yeah. that, especially now with web-based STARE um, yeah. and that, that comment you made. Um, um, another question was, how does the loss of resources differ between veterans and adult survivors of childhood trauma, or is it relatively similar? Which is a question I had, I maybe wanted you to talk about, which you, I know you've used STARE and you, in your work in life, have treated many different populations from when I worked with you as adult survivors of childhood abuse, but then first responders in 9-11, I know you've done adolescents. So I guess sort of maybe commenting on how loss of resources differs between veterans, adult survivors, maybe these other. I have to say they're not so different. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, many veterans have a history of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or ACEs. And um, some people do very well in the military. 
some people, you know, have exposure to combat and they don't do so well. Some people experience military sexual trauma, right? Which is pretty terrible in terms of um, institutional betrayal, trauma, mm. really rough. Um, so I don't see that much of a difference in the presentation, the history or the presentation. What I will say very interestingly, after 20 years of working yeah. in the community is that veterans work really hard. They are very in, a, in this skills-based program. They like workbooks. They like instructions. They like goals to achieve. Um, it is part of military culture um, to have these values. And I was pretty amazed at the way in which veterans said, of course, you know, workbook makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> you know, of course, I, I should have goals for this week. And yeah, so the, so the engagement in the work has been more sustained and the commitment clearer. Um, yeah. That's really in interesting. Ge in, in general. In general, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, a picture, uh, a couple of questions that aren't very, aren't completely stare specific, but um, more broad related to survivors of childhood abuse or chronic abuse. So one question was um, that survivors of childhood abuse may, do they face challenges in asking for therapeutic help in the first place? And how do you bridge the gap between those experiencing trauma, symptoms, and PTSD and taking steps to get mental health services? Um, particularly in, uh, in marginalized groups such as immigrants, refugees, and survivors of sex trafficking? So it's a big question, but um, I guess it's about um, how trauma itself makes people less likely maybe to seek help. And there are ways of, um, there may be people actually in this audience who know people who've had trauma, who want them to get help and you kind of bridge that. Yeah. Um... I think on the individual provider level or in small clinics or you know, small communities, I think it's important to normalize the experiences, you know, not sound shocked when people say, well, this happened to me, like oh, that happened to you, how could that happen to you? You know, to be, to be aware that these things happen, um, to um, respond compassionately and sympathetically, um, and to accept that this is part of life for some people. Um, and I think so, and related to that, secondly, is to have um, public policy and marketing of um, these events and these types of experiences so that the general population knows that these things happen, aren't shocked by it in, in a kind of rejecting way um, and are aware of their occurrence, understand that people, the reasons why people um, can become victims in these situations. I think it's very important, you know, after 9-11, for example, an event that was relatively easy for people to understand, um, you know, PTSD became a household world word and very accepted as something real. And when I asked people, well, um, why do you now believe in PTSD? And why <laughs> And yeah. why uh, are you sympathetic and compassionate to the people who were exposed to this event? They say, because it could have been me. Mm -hmm. It could have been my city. And that's helped me think about what we need to do for people who do, who have, who are exposed to events that seem less similar to mm -hmm. us in day-to-day -day life is, um, be, letting people become aware of it and that it is real and that who knows maybe it could happen or has happened you know to family members or to yourself and that it's okay yeah that's a great point I mean having been in New York you know worked with you after 9-11 and um, that's a, it's so true I can actually remember before 9-11 a very senior somewhat mentor said to me oh, this PTSD and trauma stuff, why are you wasting your time on this? You're so smart and promising. Why don't you do something real like depression? I remember, <laughs> yeah. of course, the person was getting PTSD funding after 9-11, but, you know, <laughs> but it was really like the sea change from before if I went on a plane and said what I studied, people would be like, hmm, you work with Vietnam veterans. And afterwards, it was sort of much more of the conversation, but you're right, there is that different, yeah. that shift, yeah. 
Um, so so our, I yeah. just want to say it did yeah. teach me the importance of sharing this information and um, right. marketing it to a very to the very general population. The cover of Time, Hollywood movies, go for it. In, yes. you know, help. Right, us. exactly. It's actually Making a motivation. It yeah, motivation for putting these kinds of things we're doing now online and having people so that the information gets out there. Um, um, and so I want to make sure we address questions related to that. So um, one question was um, whether there's an adolescent version of STAIR, and I believe there is, or you've done an adolescent version or groups with adolescents? Or yeah, we I developed an adolescent protocol and it was used pretty effectively. Um, and I'm happy to share it if okay. somebody wants it. We actually ultimately developed a very, very beautiful protocol and uh, very good looking, very easy to follow. Um, but, you know, some things catch on and some things don't. Okay. It depends okay. on, you know, researchers' lives. Oh, I remembered the difference in the Yazidis. Yes. And also possibly the Latinx is the role of spirituality. Oh, interesting. Lives. Yes. With Yazidis, very important. They were persecuted for their religion. And a lot of the cognitive reappraisals had to do with reasserting commitment to their religion and some beliefs that support them um, to recovery. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, some of the other questions people have is, um, should they purchase the 2020 book or, and, or both, do they need both books? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, you don't I need think both books. The 2020, the 2020, that would have been my response, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how people might access, are there trainings um, or how people access the telehealth model or methods and the treatment you've shown and what's the name of the app? There's a whole bunch of questions like okay. that kind of So stuff. the app is called Stair Coach and you can download it, it's free. Okay. Um, Webster will be free to the public in about a year. You know, right now it's going through research and it's going to be migrated to, you know, the VA server and ultimately available not only to all veterans, but to all people. So it'll just, it'll take some time. Okay. And we okay. do have workbooks that can go with the web stairs so that people could use it well. Um, okay. That's, and I, yeah, I know the person who asked the adolescent, so I can, uh, is there a mm -hmm. version in Spanish? That's another, no, maybe, no, not okay. really. I mean, yeah. unless Sarah has something, right. Unless there was something they use related to their treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And receiving the adolescent version. Um, um, so um, one thing is maybe um, uh, Becca who's on this can put in the chat, the way to people can sign up for our email list. Cause we can email links to some of these resources, some of the articles and stuff. And the, um, uh, for the people who are asked at, or email me people for the, and I can connect you with the adolescent version. Um, and um, okay, there's a lot of, a lot more questions. Um, um, so I guess to, to, I guess we're finishing up. So I guess one question, this is kind of a big question, but to finish up. Um, so one person asks, well, childhood abuse leaves very deep seated marks and, you know, affects some conscious appraisals and unconscious appraisals. and all kinds of, as you know, I know, models of human interactions and assumptions. So can these shorter term therapies really address that, something that, um, or what are the limit, maybe the limitations or um, lack of limitations you've seen? I think that the critical thing that the short term therapies do is provide people with insight that they can think about things differently and that people can view them differently with respect and compassion. And that these are experiences that anchor the process of long-term recovery. That there may be relapses, that there may be more work to do, but this provides a foundation, hopefully a very strong foundation for work that uh, I think people have uh, revolutions in their thinking and feeling um, in these, short-term therapies, that that's possible. Like I always blamed myself, I was always ashamed. And now, wow, by somebody, by my therapist saying you're not to blame, changed, you know, exploded my framework and gave me a new one to work on. Right, yeah, so I can, and I can, having not, um, having been a therapist at one time where I used STARE, um, I can remember uh, people who sort of, suffered for decades, decades from the effects of their abuse and having really life, having real life transforming experiences within the 
period of treatment. That's not to say there wasn't more to do, right? But that that it what could be life transforming. So, yeah, I think I want to say that you know what you try and do in the therapy here, maybe others is is provide a feeling of hopefulness yeah. and also imagination for what is possible. I think the resource that you've lived your life this way for two decades. I'm here to open a door to what is possible, you know, to fill your imagination. You've been given a steady diet, you know, of bread. There's chocolate cake out there here, taste it. <laughs> exactly, I like that. There's chocolate cake out there. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thank you so much, Marilyn. That went too fast. And unfortunately, I'm sorry for all the questions we couldn't answer, um, but please look in the chat for the participants, look in the chat for the different links um, Becca has put there um, and reach out and we can make sure that you get resources are connected if you have questions. But thank you so much, Marilyn. Take care. Sure. My pleasure. Stay safe. Take and care. Love you to your family. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.